northern Australia and a moment to savour. Within minutes, this place can turn into hell on earth. The temperature will start rising into the high 90s and swarms of biting insects will take to the air. This tropical woodland absolutely teems with wildlife and it's that very abundance of life that makes travelling here such a challenge. In fact, this environment has the very real potential to turn a journey into a nightmare. Of all the places in the world I've been, and that's every kind of natural environment on the planet, this wilderness, called Arnhem Land, is one of the most inhospitable there is. This is the country of man-eating crocodiles, deadly spiders, and nine out of 10 of the world's most venomous snakes. But the number one terror here is mosquitoes. Their potent bite is simply intolerable. The last sound recorders to came to Arnhem Land with me was conveniently on holiday when this trip came up. I think it's probably got something to do with waking up each morning with his eyes so swollen he couldn't see out of them. <laughs> The reason I've come back is to retrace a journey that ranks as one of the all-time feats of endurance and survival. Arnhem Land is wild country isolated at the top of Australia's Northern Territory. It's pristine wilderness covering an area the size of Ireland. This land is a mosaic of open woodland, grassy plains, mangroves and swamps. For more than 20,000 years, this remote tropical region has been home to Aboriginal hunters. Over the years, on several visits, I've been lucky enough to live with the Aborigines and learn from them how to survive in this harsh land where food is scarce and water hard to find. Tourists aren't allowed to enter this land, probably just as well. This isn't the terrain for the faint-hearted. It's incredibly easy to get lost in this flat, featureless woodland. And if you did get into trouble, you'd be lucky to survive more than a few days. If you can find fresh water here, it's best to take full advantage. This billabong is the only drinking water for hundreds of square miles, which is why I'm going to build my camp here. Like all things Aboriginal, my shelter will be simple but very effective. What's more, it takes only about an hour to build. To cover my shelter, all I need is to peel layers of bark from the paper bark tree. Done correctly, the tree is unharmed. You need a shelter here to provide shade from the baking sun as well as protection from the frequent tropical downpours. This paper bark is absolutely brilliant stuff for shelter building. Of course, it's got thousands of other uses as well. But with just a few sheets of that, the shelter will be completely covered. The next thing to think about, though, is fire. If you found yourself lost out here, you might think that these burned out areas had nothing to offer, but you'd be wrong. They're full of useful things. Take this for example. This is the red flowered Kurajong. Now this is a young plant growing and it's got lots of uses. I could take the bark off of this to make string, or I could dig up the root and get food and a big drink of water. This is the same plant that got burned last year. And down at the base of this, you find these nice dry sticks, which are perfect for friction fire lighting. I love the elegant simplicity of this method of fire lighting, but everything's more difficult in Arnhem Land, and the high humidity means I've really got to work at it.
probably the best form of carbohydrate for a survivor in this environment is going to be this plant here, the pandanus, because it's very easy to learn to recognise it. The bit we need is at the base of these central leaves, but they're covered in spines, so you've got to be really careful, otherwise we're going to end up with a handful of thorns, the last thing you need in a survival situation. And that's the bit there, that white bit at the base. It's a bit like a, the heart of a palm tree. It's delicious. Mm. One of the advantages of camping right by a billabong is there's loads of food. Not only have I got lots of plants, but here in the dead leaves on the pond edge, I'm finding these freshwater mussels and that's the sort of protein you want in a survival situation, one you just pick up with your hands. But I've also seen lots of wallaby tracks here and if I was here long enough I could make some sort of weapon and hunt them if I had to. When dusk falls, plagues of mosquitoes come out in a feeding frenzy. Their bite is exquisitely painful. By far the most effective mosquito repellent and still widely used by Aborigines is the smudge fire. You make this by collecting pieces from the inside of this type of termite mound. The smoke given off from the fire when this stuff burns is an extremely effective deterrent. Arnhem Land is vast. Countless people have died here from exposure and starvation. But it's also the setting for one of the most remarkable stories of survival. During the Second World War, the Royal Australian Air Force flew regular sorties over Arnhem Land. They were defending the Northern Territories against the constant threat of Japanese invasion. In May 1942, three airmen were on a mission to rescue an injured soldier. They had lost their bearings and were rapidly running out of fuel. The pilot had no option other than to make an emergency landing. In an instant, the three airmen found themselves catapulted back to the Stone Age. And that's exactly what this series is about. What happens when you find yourself in a situation where you have to rely solely upon your own resources with none of today's mod cons? Sometimes in those situations, ordinary people do extraordinary things. These pictures are a remarkable record of the crash and do little to foretell the horrors to come. They were taken in high spirits as the men were confident they'd be rescued. George Booth was the wireless operator, Frank Smallhorn was the pilot, and Phil Bronk, the only one still alive today, was a medical officer with the Australian Air Force. We were quite exhilarated, really, that we'd survived a crash. We weren't worried. We had full confidence in the uh, Air Force picking us up. We didn't make too much of the way of preparations because uh, regulations stated at that time you had to stay with the aircraft for seven days. Uh, and then after that you should look for other means of getting out of there. Back in the 1940s, looking for a plane down in Arnhem Land was like looking for a needle in a haystack. But the advice given to airmen back then is just as true today as it ever was. If you crash in the bush, stay with your plane because you're more easy to spot from the air than if you wander into the bush on your own. In the hope a search plane would fly overhead, the men made themselves as visible as possible by spreading out a parachute, the textbook thing to do. Parachutes make excellent signals as they provide maximum contrast with the landscape and are easily spotted from the air. They also built a fire with the aircraft tires and had aviation fuel on standby for instant lighting. There's more to signal fires than you might think. The most important bit is here. Lots of dry material to create plenty of heat and to burn quickly. 
I've raised all of that up on a stable platform at least two feet off the ground. That keeps it away from moisture and allows plenty of air in. And then on top, there's green material to create smoke. Now with all that heat, you don't just get smoke, you get a thermal column that punches the smoke into the sky. If you don't happen to have a lighter handy, there are other ways to get a fire going. The airmen could have used their binocular lenses, but I found that my matte magnifying glass gave instant fire. Signal fires are only really effective when there's not much wind. As you can see, the smoke from my fire isn't that visible. The wind's dispersing it over a large area. By far the most effective signaling method here is a hand mirror. The reflection can be spotted at a distance of over 80 miles. Even though the stranded Australian airmen made good signalling arrangements, days went by and it dawned on them that they weren't going to be rescued. We thought we'd be, we'd be found the next day, that the search party would find us the next day, or the second day, or the third day. But of course that didn't happen. Hello, any station. This is Alpha 146. We have crash landed somewhere in Arnhem. Can anybody hear us? Over. The men spent idle hours on the radio until the batteries finally gave out. They also tried to send SOS messages with their Morse code transmitter, but no one ever received them. I think the lowest point for all of us, I'm pretty sure of that, was when we when they failed to find us at the, at the, at the crash site. Time had run out. That was the important thing. I mean, after seven days and no sign of an aircraft, well, that was it. A week into their ordeal, the men began to fear that the swamp would become their tomb. We knew that uh, we weren't going to be picked up and uh, the whole scenario changed. We had to think about some other way of getting out. On day nine, their spirits were lifted by the discovery of a tidal river, which they thought might lead them to safety. The men studied their aviation map and figured that the river would take them to the coast at a mission station marked on an island 150 miles away. So with extraordinary ingenuity, the men set about building a raft from bits of the plane. It had to have some buoyancy for the raft. So we took out the two main tanks and the two auxiliary tanks and joined them together with saplings and parachute cord. It was limited because uh, if we struck any rough rocks and things in the trip you know, and the thing was whole, well, that would be the end anyway, but we had to take that chance. But our spirits lifted when we found that there was a chance of uh, getting out of the swamp. first two bends, everything went well. In the third bend, the crocodiles will come off the bank. I suppose at least uh, 15 footers of big, big crocodiles. And one actually stood off the bank right on, almost on top of George, which uh, gave him nightmares for a few weeks. In a recent survey of the river the men rafted down, 1,600 saltwater crocodiles were counted. These are the most aggressive species of this ancient predator. No human can outrun a charging crocodile. They can reach land speeds in excess of 40 miles an hour. I can really relate to how vulnerable they felt. When you stand on a raft, you don't feel at all safe. And up here, 
it's crocodiles that rule the roost. They're one of the oldest and largest predators on the planet. And you better know that when you come into this wilderness, they're in charge. You are just a visitor. Anywhere along the water's edge, you're at great risk. Now that fella, well, he's only a couple of meters long. But a few weeks ago, there was one seen in Darwin Harbor that's estimated at 11 meters in length. That means his mouth is almost as wide as this boat. Gurman and Barnall, the Aborigines who took me to watch the crocodiles, fear this animal like no other. In fact, a few years ago, their aunt was taken by a crocodile while she was fishing on the bank. By now, the men had drifted about 10 miles downstream. The few cans of bully beef they had with them on the plane had run out, and their water was rapidly dwindling. Mosquitoes and sandflies were a constant torment, not to mention the ever-present threat of crocodiles. Twelve days had passed since the crash, and as the river widened, the men realized they would soon be at sea, where the danger of crocodiles was replaced by inquisitive sharks who had the unnerving habit of circling their raft. Eventually, the men landed on one of the beaches along the coastal peninsula of Arnhem Bay. Have a look at this rough map of their journey. This is where they believe they'd crash landed. And there's the river that they've gone up on their raft. Now, when they got out in the open, they found themselves in this bay, Arnhem Bay. They crossed that, making first landfall here at Flinders Point. Water was getting pretty low, so we decided on five mouthfuls a day each for the time being. We were sucking pebbles to uh, relieve the thirst. It's been an old-fashioned method over the centuries, I believe, to, I think the Arabs used to do it. So we thought we'd try it. It does help. It creates sort of moisture in your mouth. We found periwinkles in fairly large quantities. And we used to boil those up and make soup and uh, taste it like poison, but they were, we felt better after it. The airmen had decided to ration what little water they had left, which on the face of it may seem the right thing to do. But the current advice is to drink whenever you're thirsty. Rationing just prolongs the agony and increases the risk of doing irreparable damage to your vital organs. Another consideration is that one of the effects of dehydration is confusion. And in the early stages of a survival situation, when you've got to make major decisions, the last thing you want to be is confused. By now, rescue was the only issue. The next week was spent sailing further along the coast. From their map, they figured they still stood a chance of making it to Elko Island and the mission station. In the evenings, they landed on beaches, but landing the raft was far from easy. The coral is razor sharp. I got coral in my right foot and uh, that eventually fested up on me. I thought that I was going to lose it at one stage. It was pretty bad. We were badly knocked about on that trip in. It took me quite a while to bandage everybody up and with iodine and uh, pads and things. And we went, I told them all like, we're not to move you know, until the blood stopped. In the tropics, any cuts or scratches can turn nasty really easily. Have a look at Danny, one of the crew members, finger here. Believe it or not, that ulcer started two days ago as a mosquito bite. So you can imagine what state the men would have been in. Eighteen days into their ordeal, the men had travelled 80 miles from the crash site. I can really relate to their sense of isolation in this vast, uncompromising landscape. 
Because the men had no survival training, the only food they managed to find were periwinkles. But if they'd been taught where to look, they could actually have enjoyed a varied diet. The airmen tried to avoid the mangroves, but actually the mangroves could have been part of their saving because it's absolutely full of food. And particularly here, we get mangrove woodland meeting coastal strip. You couldn't find anywhere better for a feast. And here, down in these pools, you find these amazing looking shellfish, telescopium snails. Now they're really easily collected and they're very good eating. Mud crabs are abundant here. For me, they taste even better than lobster. The irony of being in Arnhem Land is that food isn't really a problem to get hold of. I've had no trouble today finding all this food. But what is difficult to come by is fresh water. Because of the really high tidal range here, salt water forces its way deep inland. And unless you've got local knowledge, finding fresh water may be nearly impossible. The men were severely dehydrated and would have died if Phil hadn't made an almost miraculous discovery. I saw a couple of little finches. I thought, well, we've got freshwater birds here, we must have fresh water. So I decided to do a little tour myself. So I found this spring, beautiful water, with all these little birds floating around it. So uh, I had a good feed of water myself. They went back and we went out of these two fellows to put some clothes on and come and taste it. It really saved our lives, that bit of water. We were almost out. Frank had said, you know, he was looking after the water. He said, well, if we hadn't have found that tonight, you know, we'd have been in real trouble. The airmen carried as much water as they could in their billy cans and continued on their voyage to find the mission station. More than three weeks had passed, and they had drifted over 150 miles. By now, they'd lost a lot of weight, and starvation was making them dangerously weak. The only thing giving them any hope was the fact that they'd managed to reach Elko Island, an extraordinary achievement. Now all they had to do was find the mission station. We decided to abandon the raft because we were too weak to handle it. We couldn't get it either in or out of the water. We didn't have the strength to cope with it. So we had to we had discard a lot of our gear uh, and make up small packs out of the blankets and uh, carry the stuff that we had. Phil and George were feeling so desperate they were considering taking an overdose of morphine from the medical kit. Well, we thought about you know, using the drugs and things that we had, take them uh, to make our passing a little bit easier if it came to that. Frank was against the whole idea. and No, he didn't think that we should be doing that under any circumstances. But George and I thought, well, no, silly to have all this damn stuff and be suffering. If we had to do it, I think we would, would have taken it. After a week on Elko Island, the men were only capable of staggering a few feet at a time. Finding no sign of the mission station, George and Phil had given up all hope, accepting the inevitable fate of death.
their salvation lay in the hands of a lone Aborigine who'd been watching their faltering progress for days. I saw this big figure coming along the beach. He looked about seven foot tall, and it was Paddy, or Matui, as he turned out his tribal name. Paddy, the tribal chief, hadn't helped them immediately because he wanted to be sure they were Australian airmen and not Japanese invaders. He said he'd known us all our lives and said he'd been watching us for days. He thought, so I, thought I thought you men along Japan. And uh, we didn't come in to see you until uh, we were sure that you were man along Australia. The Aborigines fed the men, gave them water, and eventually led them to safety. Frank and George quickly recovered, but Phil spent a year in hospital being treated for his tropical ulcers. I think our greatest problem is uh, these days, uh, servicemen are uh, trained in survival living off the country, we had none at all. It was only our own initiative that you know, we, we could use. But, uh, it was a dreadful experience. I think we were lucky to get out of it. The three airmen story here of survival against all odds is a truly remarkable achievement. But if they hadn't met the Aborigines, they would have perished here. Arnhem Land is a truly harsh and unforgiving environment that offers little hope to those who have no knowledge of how to live here. The airmen had done astonishingly well to survive more than a month. They were effectively aliens in this land, thrown back in time. In reality, all they had done was slow down the rate at which they were dying. The Aborigines, by contrast, are the true masters of this environment. Over thousands of years, they've adapted their lifestyle to live in harmony with this land, passing on their knowledge from one generation to the next. If there's one thing the airman story shows, it's that you can only survive in places like Arnhem Land by working with nature, not battling against it. Thank you.